Orange County's popular sheriff has had to deal with some unpopular issues lately. An embarrassing escape from the jail, an informant controversy in the jail, and outside the jail, crimes on the rise. How is she responding? Sheriff Sandra Hutchins, next on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Hi, I'm Rick Reef. Welcome to Inside OC. It's been almost eight years since Sandra Hutchins, a former L.A. County Sheriff's Chief, came out of retirement to take over a scandal-wracked Orange County Sheriff's Office. She cleaned things up and has remained a popular public official. But there have been problems and plenty of challenges. Here to discuss, Orange County Sheriff Sandra Hutchins. Sheriff, thanks for coming on. My pleasure, Rick. So I notice you're looking like no sheriff that I would normally picture, okay? So how do you decide, uh, you know, today I'll wear my uniform, today I won't? Right. It really it kind of depends on what I'm doing that day. Um, I wore my uniform a couple of times this week. I, you know, I try to not wear it at certain occasions because people re react a little bit differently to you when you're in the uniform. And, and I think sometimes the uniform can be a, a barrier. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, I've, I've, I've heard from some of our, my constituents that we'd like to see the deputies co you know, co copy with a cop. Maybe they could be out of their uniform so we can see them on a more human uh, uh, side. A kinder, gentler side. Right, well, exactly. Well, well, thanks, because I, I don't yeah. feel as intimidated as I might. Good. So I, I, I thank, th thank you for not pulling that card on I don't think me, I you know? intimidate okay. you. So. <laughs> <laughs> so almost eight years. Uh, how's it gone so far for you? It's been interesting. You know, when I came in, um, we were in the register every day in the LA Times, and uh, we just couldn't seem to get uh, out of the papers. Uh, that was in the aftermath of the scandals that former Sheriff Mike right. Corona finally wound up going to prison. Right, uh, the or, death in the jail, uh, the Chamberlain right. murder. Yeah. Uh, and so, and then the fiscal crisis that hit us all. Uh, and so, in the midst of trying to do a lot of positive change in the department, we had to address a serious fiscal crisis, and I ultimately laid uh, top staff off, and I laid off people that uh, were non-sworn individuals right. in the organization. Uh, but, you know, in a crisis, you come together. And so uh, looking back, uh, while I, I didn't like it at the time, having to make those tough decisions yeah. and, and trying to do more with less, as you say, um, we, we came together as a department because uh, I was an outsider who had come in. So we went through a crisis. And sometimes I think you have to go through a crisis to get together. And we learned how to do things more efficiently. So I, my glass is always half full. I Great. try and look at the positive side well, let's, of let's, let's talk about the positive side. Yeah. What, what, what do you really like about being sheriff? I love law enforcement. I love being involved in law enforcement. I love seeing good law enforcement done. Um, I like being involved to where we are really serving the community and the community is part of what we are doing. So um, I, public safety, not just the actual public safety, but people who may have fear, uh, we want to address that. We want people to feel safe in the community and anything that I can do as part of that, um, I, it's really rewarding to me. And just seeing, I mean, I wish I could get back out there in a patrol car again with all the tools yeah. uh, that, that they have today and all the technology. I wouldn't know how to use half of it if I put me out in right. a car based on what I started with. Um, but I love seeing great police work being yeah. done, and, and I see that every day. I was warned by my best advisor, my wife, Mary Ann, Rick, <laughs> don't go there with the sheriff. It's going to sound condescending or whatever, but the gender, right. the gender, okay? And so maybe she was right. I shouldn't have gone there. But, but, but what, what's that like? Is that like, that's yesterday's news. Nobody cares about that anymore. Or is there something significant about the fact that you are a woman sheriff of a major county? You know, I really, after I got selected, that was one of the first questions I got coming out of the boardroom. What does it feel like to be the first sheriff of Orange County? And my comment was, I, I don't want to be viewed as the first 
woman sheriff, I want to be viewed as, you know, I was qualified for this right. position. But I think it's significant. I didn't realize that was how significant until I got into the position. And what surprised me is I had men with their daughters. They would come up to me and say, I want my daughters to, to meet you so that they know they can do anything they want to in their lives. I didn't expect that. I had women of all generations. I really thought that, that women of prior generation would not see me in the role of sheriff. As you say, people say, well, you don't look like a sheriff, yeah. um, the stereotypical sheriff. Right. But I had women of all ages say, I, you know, and they would tell me about their struggles that they had in their careers, regardless of what it was. And so it, 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 is, it is much more important than I, than I thought it yeah. was. And I think it gives young women coming up in law enforcement, you know, the belief that, yes, they can, they can do it. You know, it's possible. Let's face it, in a department in a law enforcement department, there's got to be a lot of uh, a macho going on. You know, how do you deal with that? Do you, do you become macho or how do you deal with that? How do you show that you're tough enough to, right. you know, have this? Position? You know, I don't become macho. You got to be yourself. You know, people mm -hmm. are going to tell right, right away, are you yourself or not? When you're on the street working as a deputy. Which you have done. Which I have done. You do put on somewhat of a facade. If you have to be tough, you have to look tough. And, and it's, you've got to, you know, you got to transmit that image to get the situation under control in certain, certain situations. But as a manager, as a leader, um, you know, you have to be yourself. Um, I can be tough. Uh, I'm seldom angry, but when I do get angry, um, people notice. If I'm not smiling, I smile a lot. If I'm not smiling, they'll say, what's wrong? Is something wrong? Um, I think that if you're honest with your folks, mm -hmm. Uh, you give them a lot of rope to do their job. You, you're not I'm, not, I'm not a micromanager, uh -huh. but if somebody screws up, you know, they know I'm going to deal with that. And that's just understood. But just being fair, um, sticking to your word, um, I'm, I can change my mind. I, I'm not stuck on if I have an idea and it doesn't work out, we got to continue with yeah. that stupid idea. I tell my staff, don't sit and tell me, Sheriff, you're great. You're doing everything wonderful. Everything's fine. Yeah. You need to tell me when something's wrong. Because if you're not telling me that, you're not serving this department. You're not serving me as a command staff uh -huh. member. Okay. Um, crime's on the rise after a couple of decades of really uh, pretty steady yeah. declining crime rates. We've seen it going up in some communities in Orange County, up 50%, maybe 25% overall. Uh, What's going on there? Well, you know, I've been in this business 37 years, and I remember back in the 90s, early 90s, remember crime was going through the roof. That's when we came up with the COPS program, three strikes, enhanced sen sentencing, uh, and gang enhancements, drug enhancements, and the crime rate went down. And now we have a situation that was really born in California out of an overcrowded, out of a lawsuit with the uh, CDCR, state prison system, um, that really began what I would call a great experiment or what the Economist magazine termed, we're doing a great experiment in California on criminal justice. Um, I think that it was time for us to take a look at criminal justice. I mean, it costs money to keep people in prison. Mm -hmm. That being said, there's some people that need to be in prison and won't, uh, you know, won't change their way of life. I do believe in doing reform efforts if we can, providing programs mm -hmm. when people are in custody. We've been doing that for years. Um, Prop 47 hit. Prop 47, and, and the data is not and there. And explain it, Prop 47. Prop 47 was called the Safe Schools and Communities Act, which I was against, and most of law Who enforcement can be against, was against the Safe Schools Act. I know it sounds wonderful, doesn't I'm it? I'm going to vote for the Safe Schools Act. But it it decreased some crimes that were felonies, like possession of heroin, right. possession of cocaine, possession of methamphetamine, but also possession of marijuana, right? Uh, possession of marijuana was already decriminalized. Oh, really? oh it was okay. already all right. An, an infraction. But, but that was a lot of people went to the polls saying, yeah, you know, because you know the whole argument right. about drugs that we have this war on drugs, and there's too many kind of, let's call them innocent people who otherwise didn't commit any crime. Right. There, so that had popular appeal. Let's get the druggies out of the jail right. and really have the bad guys in jail. So that's yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. And so, you know, that was just a lie. I mean, we, I don't have people in my custody for possession of marijuana unless they're possessing a lot of marijuana and it was for sales. 
Uh -huh. um, it's uh, just routine possession of marijuana is an infraction. They get a traffic citation. It's been that way in this state for, for years. So, uh, so it also on thefts, it, it decreased the penalty on thefts. So now you have business owners who have people coming in committing a theft. If it's under a certain threshold, it's a misdemeanor. They come and we give them a citation. Then they come back into the same store and commit another theft. So that is on the wow. rise. Um, if theft of a gun that's under $950, most guns that are used on the street illegally are under $950, yeah. I'll guarantee you. So that became a, a misdemeanor. I, I would not go so far as to say at this point that property crimes, in particular property crimes in Orange County are going up. I would not say that I could say that that is directly related to Prop 47. I can tell you in my gut that if you're a heroin addict and I take your heroin away from you and I give you a citation and release you, which is what we do, what are you going to have to do? You're a heroin addict, you're gonna to have to go out and steal something to go get more heroin. And so, so you know, you would, your gut level would tell you that that could have an, an impact on our property crimes. I hesitate because so many things impact crime rates. You know, uh, a lot of the police departments have had to reduce, uh, and sheriff's department mm -hmm. reduce the size of their agencies because of the economic downturn. Some cities are still recovering from that. So less cops on the street, um, AB 109, you know, now we Which have, was, uh... what, that was the prisoner shift from California state prison those people was that, that the realignment the were, realignment or, or what yeah. you were talking about a little earlier what, the realignment uh, the, the, yes. the, the, because of prison overcrowding prison so overcrowding some people call it realignment right it, we're going to reduce the prison population right same thing and you know they were under court order to do that right um, they were going to have to start paying huge fines if they did not so the prisoners who would have been sentenced to state prison moving forward for certain non-sexual non-serious, non-violent felons right. were now, are now kept in, in county jails. And those who are paroled from prison, from state prison for those same offenses are now under county probation instead of state parole. Yeah. Um, I really think that was a positive because I think locally we have a bigger interest in managing that population in terms of increased crime at the local level than say state parole who uh -huh. has stretched pretty thin. Um, but it, it has increased the burden on local uh, jails to house these inmates. And uh, we have 70% felons, 30% misdemeanors. 20 years ago, that was reversed. Most of your county jail inmates were misdemeanors. Now, uh -huh. the majority are felons. Well, if, they're, if the felons, uh, I guess I'm thinking, well, where does it, what does it matter if the felons are in a state prison or in a county jail? Uh, why does that, why would that impact the crime rate? Oh, that does that doesn't impact the crime rate. It's the people that are released on uh, parole or probation. So some of those misdemeanor people, right. you because you got the felons in there, you let them out, and some of them will commit crimes. No, that, we we and we're not doing early releases in this county. Some counties are. You're right. Some counties are are having to do that because some of the local jails, uh -huh. just like the state prisons, are overcrowded, and subject to the same kind of lawsuits that uh -huh. the state was. Here in Orange County, we're not. Okay. Um, but it just makes for a more challenging environment in the jail. Uh, okay. In the past, we would put people on work release. Well, we don't have very many we can put on work release because they have serious charges. Uh -huh. um, in, in the past, we would have them doing right. certain jobs in the, in the facilities well, to help keep know, those facilities running. I've seen, I, I, I'm sure you've seen all the papers there. We've got criminologists at the University of California, Irvine, mm -hmm. who you know, mm -hmm. talk about this. And I think they generally say the evidence doesn't suggest that realignment has uh, impacted the crime rate. Would you agree or disagree? I just with that? got through reading a report by, uh, well, actually, it was a compilation of all of the research that has been on the realignment and, and Prop 47, yeah. primarily realignment, though. And the conclusion is there's not enough data. And I would agree. The conclusion was there's not enough data to say whether it is impacting the increase in crime or not. Because in that in that assembly bill, there was no money set aside yeah. to collect the data or mechanism okay. to collect the mm -hmm. data or to pay for research, which uh -huh. I would agree with the researchers yeah. that we need to have that data. We need to do that research 
to identify what right. really is driving uh -huh. crime rates. Right. But you're the sheriff. You've got a feel, as you say. You've got a feel for things. Do you think that uh, prison realignment has contributed uh, to a rising crime rate? In your gut? I don't. In my gut, Prop 47 has more potential right, so than, the, than the realignment right. piece of it in okay. my gut. And in your gut, has Prop 47, ha is that having an impact? Um, Again, I can't prove it by data, but in my gut, yes, I have to yeah. think just by the scenario that I that I gave you. And what we're where we're seeing the rise is in here in our areas that we police right. is in property crime. But there's another thing going on. It's that people, and this is a good thing, people in Orange County feel safe. So when we do have an uptick in property crimes, and I go out to a community to talk to a group, mm -hmm. I've already done the research with my with my folks that yeah. work the area. And so a lot of times it's the garage that was left open. It was the front door that was unlocked. It was the iPad that was left on the car seat uh -huh. uh, where the car is unlocked. So I always tell the public we have to take a certain responsibility for yeah. our own safety by securing it, making it more difficult for crooks who, by and large, are pretty yeah. lazy. And they're looking for an opportunity to get into a house, to get into a car. Mm -hmm. And if it's unlocked, sometimes they just go over, check in the handles to see what they can get into. Yeah. So let's not make ourselves uh, it, a is, victim. Is that the best response or is there something else that can be done to address what's going on right now with rising crime? Well, I think we, we have to take a serious look at what's causing the crime. We have to continue to take those people who are committing crimes off the street. Um, we need to, for those who are uh, who want to get involved in programs while they're in jail and continue those programs while they're out there, out of jail, I think drug abuse uh, really drives a lot of these property crimes, as I mentioned. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that programming, you know, a combination of jail programming, our collaborative courts are, yeah. are fantastic in Orange County. You know, they, it's kind of a carrot and stick approach mm -hmm. to get people to change their ways. And just uh, uh, before, before we leave this uh, topic, I was kind of interested, uh, when the crime rate was going down, do you think that three strikes, the three strikes law, which has been criticized uh, in many places, uh, contributed to a decrease in crime rate? I do, I do, because the, the, the facts are, it's a small percentage of the population that commit most of the crimes. And if they're off the street, they're not committing those crimes. And so, you know, three strikes, yeah. um, you know, you, you got the chance several times yeah. to change. It's not counting all the crimes they may have committed yeah. and not been caught for. Right. So um, I, I thought three strikes good. was was a good and good legislation. Just to underscore one other thing that you said. I'm a, uh, uh, you know, I have that libertarian bent, and I think you shouldn't throw people in jail for smoking marijuana, you know, and that kind of thing. And and yet, I if I heard you correctly, it's not like people are sitting in jail if. All they're doing is being a drug addict, or uh, no, or, or uh, ex explain no. that because well, I think there's you know, a perception that that goes on and that contributes. Right. To the well, we we prior to Prop 47 passing, I think a lot of folks forgot that uh, there's been a, another Prop 36, but a prior Prop 36 allowed for a, a person who was arrested on drug possession to go to drug court or to go to a program and actually get the arrest stricken off their record. They could do that one, two, three times. I've talked to the judges who would see these folks and give them that opportunity. That was prior to Prop 47. So no, we weren't throwing, I mean, we're, yes, are we arresting them and putting them in jail? Do they go through the court system? But then they have that choice to make. They could go mm -hmm. into a program or the judge would say, okay, you're gonna serve your sentence. So we already had that. Um, but I, I have to say, um, to your point, uh, drug addiction is very hard to break. It's very hard to break. And so, um, you know, I can kind of understand how these people have a difficult time and they have to want to be in the program. So I think another important aspect of what we do and what we're doing in the Orange County Sheriff's Department is drug education for the kids and for their parents. Mm -hmm. Because every day there's some new drug out on the market that's being you know, solicited to kids and when yeah. they don't know much about it and the parents don't know much about it. It's hard to keep up with all of the, the yeah. drugs and the herbs you know, until mm -hmm. they're classified they're an herb. Um, so uh, I think that's a big part of, it's much easier to keep kids off drugs than get adults off drugs later on down the road. Wow.
Uh, you know, I have heard that the millennial generation has fewer social pathologies than other generations. They're not doing drugs as much. Uh, they're not committing as many crimes. Do you have a gut feel for that? Is that? Uh... Um, I think that's true. I mean, I, and I think they're more, more socially conscious. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I would say I, I, I would think that that is true. But, you know, we've got to watch out for those kids who feel marginalized, um, who feel like they're by themselves or who come from troubled homes where there might be drug abuse in the home. Um, those are the kids that we have to worry about. I'm not to, meaning to suggest that it's just kids that come yeah. from troubled homes because we have kids at all socioeconomic levels. Right. Heroin, you know, is a big epidemic yeah. now. And that was spawned out of opioid abuse uh, addiction to pain medications, which the medical industry is now looking at. Do we need to give a high school football player mm -hmm. he, who's got an injury 30 Vicodin? Right. Is that a good idea? Uh, because it's very addictive very fast. Yeah. Uh, we, have, uh, we have spent so much time on the crime rate. I, I promoted the idea we were going to talk about the jailbreak, the informant controversy. We're not going to have time to do that on this segment, but you kindly offered to stay a little longer. So I think we're going to do a part two. So folks watching right now can, uh, can tune in, and we will talk about that next time. But right now, let's, let's continue with this. Okay. Let's talk about something else that I wanted to uh, cover with you, and that's Homeland Security. You have a lot of experience in that. You did it when you were in Los Angeles County. You're now the sheriff of this county. You know what happened in San Bernardino. Mm -hmm. What is, in your opinion, the state of Homeland Security and our re readiness to, uh, to address that and respond to it? Right. Well, after 9-11, as you know, I think the nation, uh, we were focused on the, the next big attack, and it didn't happen. I, th I really think that um, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and local law enforcement, and all the federal agencies involved in this has done a great job of preventing that from happening. However, now we have the San Bernardino style attack, the person next door who blends in, who's a coworker, who now is being recruited by ISIS or ISIL to do an attack here, as opposed to traveling abroad and doing the attack there. So I think that's our, our, our big challenge now. And I think the residents of Orange County need to know that we have a fusion center in Orange County, the Orange County Intelligence Assessment Center, where, and we have officers and healthcare workers and firefighters uh, trained in terrorism. They're terrorism liaison officers. So we want the, the community to report anything unusual they see to us so that we can look at it, review it, and see if there's any nexus to terrorism. Are, are people reporting more things? Do you get more calls? I'm, I'm suspicious of my neighbor, that, that type of thing. We don't get enough. I mean, we get calls, and I say we don't get enough because when I go out and talk about this, people will say, well, Sheriff, I didn't know if it was really something. I just looked odd. I didn't want to call you and bother people. And, I, and that's, that's where I get concerned that we're not getting enough calls. Because in San Bernardino, they were building a lot of these devices in a garage. Um, somebody must have seen something. Uh, and it's going to be the innocuous person next door who's following all the rules otherwise, and you don't think that yeah. there's a problem. So uh, nobody knows their neighborhood better than the people that live there. So I, I would say we're, we're fine if it turns out to be nothing, but call us because it could be something. And that's yeah. our best defense. And what do you do then? I mean, do you knock on a person's door or what, uh, you know, how do you, or is that? Uh, well, you know, we'll vet it, you know, we'll vet it. We, we may look into that person. There may have been other reports. <laughs> about that kind of activity or about that individual that we'll look at. Uh, if, it arise, if it arises to something we think we need to be concerned about, then it goes to the FBI, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, of which local law enforcement yeah. are members as well. So a lot of our tips in Orange County have led to investigations. Uh, Overall, uh, uh, we're almost out of time. V very worried about what's, what might happen, somewhat worried or kind of confident. Where are you on the scale? I, um, I would say somewhat worried. Um, I, I say that because I know that we are bombarded by 24-7 media about what is happening. I think what's more likely is, you know, a workplace type yeah. violence. You know, not San Bernardino was in a workplace, but that was a terrorist act. Yeah. But a workplace violence, yeah. those kinds of things. Um, and and, and I, I, 
we get the impression it's happening all the time and it's not. Okay. I don't want to, you know, minimize it, uh -huh. but I don't want people to be unnecessarily okay. frightened to go out into the community as well. Sheriff, thank you so much. And thanks for uh, sticking around thank for uh, for a part two. Well, that's it for now. Uh, thanks again to my guests for this segment, Sheriff Sandra Hutchins. You can watch this show and past shows by going to pbsocal.org or rickreef.com. Also catch our shows and our post-show open mic chatter on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Five Point. Five Point is an independent real estate development company with assets under management across California. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Memorial Care is transforming the way healthcare is delivered, keeping our communities and businesses healthy by guiding them on the path to wellness with easily accessible hospitals, physician offices, and outpatient centers. Memorial Care, leading the way.